Hi everyone, I'm going to be summarizing chapter 12, Coercion and Conscience in Coercion and its Fallout by Murray Sidman. Um, Sidman opens up the chapter by recognizing that as human beings, we tend to be indecisive in some of our decision making. We can weigh out different outcomes and make a choice on what we want to do based on which outcome is less conflicting. So sometimes we can get stuck going back and forth between things and we could wind up not choosing to do either of them. Um, when making decisions, we have to weigh out the consequences. We can either save up our money, for example, and buy the expensive new television we want, or we can risk getting caught and stealing it and go to jail, potentially. There are many examples um, of these situations that Sidman recognizes that anyone come, can come across on a daily basis. Sometimes I find myself in a situation where I would go back and forth about maybe eating an extra snack before bedtime, and I'm always craving something sweet. So after dinner, I wanna have a little snack, but I know that I have to stick to clean eating. Um, but I find myself thinking, well, it would only be this one time, or. I wouldn't eat another snack for maybe a week, but I wind up not eating the snack because I know it wouldn't be good for me. So Sinman mentions that our conscience is supposed to keep us from choosing to do things that are tempting, but not good for us. We may actually feel like our mind is being pulled in two different directions, <clears throat> but our conscience is supposed to keep us in check. There's a point where we get so accustomed to listening to our own conscience that all decisions come easy to pick, all decisions would come easily to pick the right path. This well-trained state, Sidman says, is nearly impossible to reach. Your conscience isn't a tangible item that you can feel, but instead it's a metaphor to refer to the thoughts you get when you have to make a decision especially a decision that could come with a punishment. Um, humans are said to be born with the notion of having a conscience, but babies do not seem to be born with that quality. They don't have the ability to tell right from wrong immediately, or they don't have to see, they don't seem to have the knowledge that the world is not centered around them. So the next session, section of the book is the origins of conscience. Um, in order to learn so that something is bad, Sidman says you must have experienced the punishment or the threat of punishment for doing that bad thing. And in the future, that learned experience should prohibit you from doing that bad action to avoid punishment. This is technically a coercive method. So a child who pushes another child down might suffer the consequence of a timeout or a timeout for pushing. The child could then learn that pushing is a bad thing to do and will lead to timeouts in the future. Um, then hopefully the child would no longer push anyone with the threat of a timeout happening. Um, Freud came up with the idea of a superego where we learn what our society's standards and morals are and the conflicts we might feel with those standards. It's important to remember that the Freudian superego, um, because it allows us to socially define what is right and wrong. Sidman gives the example of a lab rat who presses a lever to receive food. In society, everything is changing in terms of moral standards. And in the case of the rat, the lever is no longer going to give it food, it's changing. So instead, when the rat presses the lever, it doesn't get food, it receives a small shock. Previously, the rat had learned that when he pressed the lever, it's a good thing, he'll get food. The rat tries a few more times, but he's still getting shocked. So the rat retreats, but he still has the temptation to press the lever. Maybe food will come this time, but there's still a risk of getting shocked. So the rat inches close and he reacts as if he was shocked, but he didn't actually touch the lever. And this back and forth pulling going, should I touch it, should I not, continues. 
until the lever begins to be so punishing for the rat to even look at. And the rat will keep its distance and sooner or later the lever becomes non-existent. So then there's another example of a baby. The world is its oyster. It has sounds, things to look at, things to touch. They'll pull or push objects and reach out for others and explore the world around them. The baby sees so many things that could look interesting to them, like a shiny vase. So the baby reaches towards the vase and knocks it over. And the baby's mother then tells the baby no and tells that's bad. The baby is removed from the vase, but it could still look tempting and shiny. The temptation to touch it again is still there. Another attempt at touching the vase by the baby results in the mother telling it the same thing. It's bad, don't touch it. The next attempt results in the baby warning itself that it is bad to touch the vase. The baby could attempt it later, um, and the baby is no longer warning itself. So the temptation is disappearing to touch the vase. In both of these examples that Sidman gave, um, the actions of the rat and the baby resulted in warnings. Both the rat and the baby were punished for doing a certain action. And after fighting the temptations to complete the action again, they were training themselves to simply not be tempted by the object anymore due to the risks it involves. So the next section is conscience and control. It's impossible to monitor everyone's actions at a constant level all times. So it's very important that if someone is growing up and in school, that they be taught to use their conscience. Once they learn how to use their conscience, when someone can no longer be watched at all times, you can rely on the person's conscience to have them know right from wrong. You could start by setting limits on children and teach them what's right from wrong with punishments. When they're doing good things, they could be left alone. They can be on their own. But when they're doing something bad, a punishment must follow it to teach them that it's a bad thing. You would watch a child at all times to protect them, but you would also watch them at all times to punish their bad behavior. Sidman says people who are extremely conscious of their actions and stick to the straight and narrow tend to be very obedient. They do what they're expected to do, but they might lack creativity and flexibility. So when society standards change, they can't seem to adapt to them. On the other hand, there are people who test the limits and they could push boundaries. They want to be unique or maybe they can live an unusual lifestyle compared to society standards. These people often go against their own conscience. Society also wouldn't be able to trust those types of people due to their lack of conscience. So this could lead to um, sorts of personality disorders or neurosis. Um, both of these people who follow their conscience and the people who do not, they're both byproducts of the coercive effects of the conscience. So the next or last section is, is the conscience to be trusted? The use of the conscience is meant to keep society within their limits and make sure it functions properly without chaos. Religion has been added to be um, used as the divine being to enhance the standards of being moral. So Sidman poses the question, is the coercive use of the conscience doing its job to protect society? Those in the professions that seek to help people, they can listen to their conscience and sometimes fail um, because the conscience is not developed for those who maybe could commit murder or theft or other illegal acts. And in those cases, society's coercive attempts have failed because the person is not sacrificing the wants of themselves for the betterment of the group or society. There are times when a person may get away with punishment and that can come along with their actions. For example, a gang leader may facilitate robberies or killings, but the loyal members of his gang would be punished for the crimes because they wouldn't turn in their leader. Um, also, wealthy companies might break some rules and gain more money from that, but and they could get punished, but it wouldn't make a difference because they have gained so much already. These illegal positive reinforcements can make the conscience slip away. 
It shows that in a position of power or wealth, so frequently you could see the punishments <clears throat> of their actions. Society has come to believe that the coercive methods of the conscience only work on the weak or the poor. So my question to all of you is, when working in the field of behavior analysis, how can we adapt our coercive methods of teaching, um, teaching conscience to help our clients better understand right from wrong?